here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about no instrumentation Golang logging with eBPF. So it's a quick background. I'm Zane. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Pixie Labs. Uh, and we're making it easy uh, for Go developers to debug applications on Kubernetes. Uh, my co-founder, Ishan, is also on the call. So feel free to uh, ping him on, on Slack if you have any uh, questions. So with that, I'll, I'll just get started. And you know, let's keep this casual. So please feel free to stop me and ask questions at any point. So here's, here's the main problem that we're interested in thinking about and talking about in, in today's talk. Uh, which is basically you're an application developer and your program is misbehaving. So typically, you know, you have a bunch of logs, so you go look at them. Um, but what usually happens is they're not in the right spot when you need them. So we've all been there and normally we just think about, you know, how do you actually go and get access to this variable uh, whenever this function is called? So typically what most people do is they go in there, stick some, you know, log statements or printouts and recompile, rerun, or redeploy the code and get the values. Um, usually a better way to do this is, you know, probably to use, use a debugger. Uh, typically you want to use logs when you can have the log statements last through the life cycle of the program, including after it's deployed to be able to get field data. Uh, when you're debugging or you need some like ad hoc statement, uh, it's usually better to go uh, use some form of debugger. So with that in mind, I'll actually start off, you know, talking a little bit about debuggers and how they work, and then actually evolve that to how we can apply the same concepts uh, using some new technology called eBPF. So I'll start at the very bottom, which is basically, okay, we have a Go binary and we want to debug it. So the first thing you do is go find a debugger that works for Go. Um, so the, the, the standard way to do this in Go is to use this thing called Delve. Uh, you can also use GDB, which is typically used for C programs. Um, it, it works because Go compiles down to machine code just like C does, but GDB has less support for things in the Go runtime. Uh, Delve is pretty easy to get started with. Uh, I have a command to, to install it over here. So once you get Delve up and running, uh, you can go and play around with the application. So you can actually use this. I, I actually don't know, are the slides available uh, as a link so people can click on the links on here? Uh, I'll, I'll share the link. Go ahead. Let's a link. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So there are some links in the slide decks uh, that you know you can use to go play around with the examples later. Uh, everything in this talk is is open source and available to to tinker with. So um, getting back to it, uh, there's this test application in this binary. Um, it's basically a very simple HTTP server. Uh, when you call the HTTP server with some arguments, it'll compute the value of e. Um, using this uh, iterative process. And depending on how many iterations you pass to it, you'll get a different, you know, potentially more accurate value of E as the number of iterations increases. It's not really important how this function works. I'm just using this to, to demonstrate how debuggers work and how you can lock things. So as a first step, um, it looks like I'm actually missing a uh, slide. Uh, sorry. So. Let me, oh. Ah, there it goes. Nope. Never mind. I will continue on. So I'm going to just go on with this. It looks like I'm actually missing a slide, which is the first step, which is basically in a debugger, you can set up a breakpoint. So you can say, like, you know, set a breakpoint on this line over here. And what it'll do is it'll actually stop the debugger and you'll be able to print out variables and be able to access their values. And then you can do things like step through the debugger, which will keep rerunning until it hits the next point when the debugger stops. Um, going further than that, one of the things that the debugger lets you get is context. So the first thing you can do is, you know, type in BT, which stands for backtrace. And what backtrace does is it actually tells you the entire you know, stack um, from, from where you are in the debugger. So you can basically get all the context about when and how this function was called. Um, you can further walk back through the stack and then check other variables and get all sorts of information. Um, another thing you can do is you know, type in GRS, which stands for Go Routines in plur plural. Uh, and you can see like, what are all the Go routines running? You know, which thread are they assigned to execute on? And uh, what's the current like execution state of the program? 
Um, I don't really want to get into too many details, but you know, with a debugger, you have this like pretty powerful machine that you can actually use to, uh, to inspect the state of your program as the program is running. So just a quick re recap on this. So, you know, what's great about debuggers, they provide you an easy way to get information about code that's already running without having to recompile it. Um, there's no need to add like print statements and recompile. You can easily step through the code and get information. So it's like super interactive. Um, furthermore, uh, things like Delve and GDB can connect to like remote binaries. So these are binaries that are running on a different machine and you can still do debugging. Um, unfortunately, you know, the, the process of actually connecting to remote binaries, I, I've found to be more uh, challenging than it needs to be. Uh, but thankfully there are other projects like solo.io that, that actually make this process much more manageable. So I'd encourage you to check them out if you haven't seen it. So then the question comes in, well, what if I have a binary in production? Um, can I just attach a debugger to it and, and get all the data that I'm interested in? Um, unfortunately, that's usually not a great idea. I mean, it can be done, uh, but part of what you'll find out is, you know, debuggers stop the program typically um, and they mutate the state of the program. So if you try to run this in production software, especially when there are lots of threads and things happening concurrently, uh, you might land up with unexpected failures, failures, and you know, have have like crashes of your of your code. So, the question is, you know, we really want to get this debugger functionality in like production software, so we we can actually reproduce the the problems in the environment that they occur, um, but we don't want to sit there and redeploy and and recompile uh, all our code. So, what else can we do? So, with that in mind, I'm going to stop for like a couple of seconds and see if there are any questions before I move on to the next step. Cool. All right, I will continue on. All right. So basically, you know, we went through and enumerated a few options. Uh, this is probably not a comprehensive list, but it, it covers most of the things you can do. Um, so the first step is just give up. Um, go add some printouts, recompile and redeploy your code. You can also consider using something more comprehensive like open tracing, which helps you do similar things like logging, but you can actually get information across many different servers. Uh, option two, well, you can give up on reliability and go with GDB and Delve on production code. Um, option three is there's a bunch of different like Linux based, S-Trace, F-Trace, utilities, or uh, LTNG and USDT, which are some of the other options. Uh, I'm not going to go into those in details, but um, just for a reference, uh, some of these technologies are actually things that the debuggers are built on. Uh, so they work and you can probably automate it so that they don't actually stop the execution, but they still tend to be pretty, pretty slow. Um, things like USDT, uh, which actually I think stands for uh, user space trace points. Those are things that are used for monitoring things or uh, I think it's static trace points. But anyways, they're used for monitoring things like garbage collection events on the JVM, which are like pretty stable things that you can actually just attach probes to. Uh, the fourth option is using, you know, something like eBPF, which is a pretty new technology. Um, so we will talk about what eBPF is and see how it can be used in this uh, context. So uh, one of the things uh, we did over here is just put this slide together, which compares all the different, different options. Um, so there's kind of like four different metrics that we're, we're interested in, right? Like which part of the code is traceable? Uh, what is the, the performance impact um, of actually running this? And then how badly did they disrupt the application? And can you actually use this for distributed analysis? So with GDB and Delve, right? You can debug pretty much anything. You can find some like arbitrary address in the program and then stop it uh, and then continue on with you know, debugging and printing variables. Uh, we have typically found the performance impact is high. They can disrupt the application and, you know, they run on a single machine. So you can't really do much distributed analysis. Uh, the other side of the spectrum is using some logging framework, uh, like let's say open tracing. You can do a lot of lo logging uh, with, you know, low to minimal uh, performance impact. Um, and again, low application disruption and have a distributed, you know, multi-node analytics because you can tag all your requests and um, uh, log messages. Uh, the option that we're looking at today uh, in this talk is something called eBPF. 
uh, which stands for the Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. Uh, it is way outgrown its name by now, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. With eBPF, you can actually trace all code, have low performance impact, low application disrupt disruption, uh, but it still only works on a single machine, so there's no distributed analysis. Uh, with that in mind, you can build some system on top of it to, to enable this. So let's look a little bit into what eBPF is. So, um, you know, this is a little bit of a, a complicated slide, so please uh, feel free to ask questions. So the best way I found to think about eBPF um, is that eBPF is a virtual machine, like a sandbox virtual machine that runs inside of the Linux kernel. So what that really means is typically all the code that's running in the Linux kernel is, is trusted, right? You want to make sure that there isn't arbitrary code running that can you know, either uh, you know, crash your machine or uh, allow it to do things like steal, steal data. So you're typically running like trusted code inside of the kernel. What eBPF allows you to do is actually essentially run untrusted code but the virtual machine and the sandbox basically guarantee that any of the code that gets executed uh, is not going to do anything it's not allowed to do. So the way eBPF works is you basically start with a C source program. And you know, while it says it's C source, it's really like a restricted form of C because you can't run arbitrary C code and guarantee that it's safe. Right? So it's a restricted version of C. You run this program, you run it through Clang. Uh, which is the C compiler, and specify that it should target BPF. And what happens over there is it'll generate this bytecode, which is a BPF program. You then take this program, and then you make a syscall. And what the Linux kernel does is it verifies that this bytecode can safely execute. And if the bytecode can safely execute, it'll basically, at that point, compile it down to machine code and then allow you to, allow you to uh, run inside of the kernel. And part of what happens with eBPF is since it's running in the kernel, you get access to all the data structures of the kernel. So you can, or most of the data structures of the kernel in various forms. So you can do things like, you know, let me know every time there's a syscall and call a function and then record those events. Um, you can martyr never traffic and use it to like enforce, uh, you know, enforce some kind of uh, firewall type filtering. But one of the cool things that eBPF can do uh, is do these things called U probes, which are basically user space probes. And what that does, um, sorry for that, uh, what that does is it allows you to actually instrument programs that are running in the user space so that uh, you can basically inject some code into it uh, to, to capture data. And we'll talk about how that works in, in one second. Any, uh, any questions on this so far? You know, feel free to ask questions because uh, the stuff is super, hey, super gnarly. Zen, there's a question from Mahindra. Are all the user functions can be traced or only syscalls? Uh, okay, so that, that's a great question. So eBPF actually has many different types of probes. Um, so there's a probe called, there's a type of probe called K probes, which is basically probes that are on kernel events and kernel functions. Right, so those things can only trace syscalls. Uh, there's another type of probe called U probe, which stands for user space probes, uh, which is actually what we'll be talking about today. And those probes can essentially trace an arbitrary binary. You just need to know some address to go stick uh, uh, the BPF hook into. Okay, great. All right, so with that in mind, we will go back to our compute E function that we had earlier, and we'll dive into the details. So uh, again, we're gonna go in super deep now. Um, so we use this program called OBJ dump, which basically allows you to dump information about the object, so the compiled binary. So what I did over here, it, it was pretty simple. I said, you know, dump the symbols in this app and then find compute E. I just use grep to find compute E. Um, so the first thing you find out is here is a function main.compute, uh, cause it's in the package main, uh, go prefixes it with main and then, uh, puts a dot compute on it. Uh, on the leftmost side over here, we get the address of where this function is located and the fact that it's located in the text section, which is where all the code is located. Um, 
So this address is, is important. So uh, let's keep that in mind. We don't need to memorize it or anything. I just, I'm calling it out that it's important. Um, the next step over here is I say, okay, OBJ dump and then um, dump and then dash D actually disassembles the binary. So what that'll do is actually print out the assembly code of the binary. Um, and then uh, I pipe that over to less and then jump down to the main.compute function. So what we notice over here is that main.compute e um, located at this address will basically jump in and there's a whole bunch of instructions that start getting executed. Uh, I should have put the uh, original code over here, but just to remind you the function signature is function compute e. The first argument is iterations, which is an int 64 and it returns a float 64 value. So just remember that it takes an iteration that's int 64. So what we see over here is when main.compute e gets called, the first thing that it does is it grabs uh, the offset uh, from the stack pointer, which is the RSP, and then it sticks it in RAX. So it goes into the RAX, which is the register uh, location. So let's just remember that for a second. So what we're gonna go over here uh, is how do we actually use your probes? So what does this mean? So if you have an app binary, Typically, this is what it'll look like for a Go binary. You have your main.compute e function, which starts at the address we saw earlier, where you have the main.main .main function, which usually will, you know, there are only two functions in this file, so it'll follow, follow main.compute e. What we actually do is ask the kernel, you know, very nicely using DTF and uprobes, that when you get to this address, instead of executing main.compute e, uh, run our uprobe U -probe hook. So instead of running this, it'll basically insert uh, what's called like a soft interrupt and that'll actually trap into the kernel and it'll execute your BPF program instead of executing the, the regular main.compute E program over here. And it'll, uh, there's this thing called a perf buffer, which basically this program can just dump data into. And then we have another binary, which we call the tracer, which will basically read the data from this perf buffer. So it's a lot of stuff over there. So I'm going to repeat that. We basically go in, instead of running main.compute, we tell the kernel patch in a function that'll call our program instead. Uh, and our program will write it to the perf buffer. And then we'll have, a, we'll have a different binary basically that reads the output of this perf buffer. All right. So what does this program look like? So that was a lot of stuff over there. Uh, so hopefully, uh, Everyone's with me on this. So eBPF, like I said, is, is written using a uh, restricted uh, C syntax. So the first thing we did over here is we say there's a perf output called trace. Uh, this can be called anything. We call it trace. Um, there's a thing called um, compute e called, which is basically some arbitrary name function we came up with, uh, which will get called whenever, um, uh, whenever compute e is called. And then it takes in a single argument, which is called context, which is a type PT regs, which is basically the pointer to the registers. Okay. So the first step over here is we read the value in the AX register. So if you remember from a couple of slides ago, we knew that the input argument was stored in RAX. So that's the register AX. We are basically reading the value in the AX register. And then we say, submit that value of the AX register that we read into the perf buffer um, and then return. So this is like pretty much like the hello world of U probes in, in BPF. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, any, any questions so far on this? Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, please ask questions because there's, there's a okay. lot of stuff over here. So. Okay, now uh, this program looks interesting. Now we need to call, uh, we need to write a C program um, of this nature. Uh, then uh, pro this program will attach to the debugger uh, and get the variable uh, that is being uh, used in the compute E. Is that right? Right. That is correct. So I'll actually, you know, just cause uh, there's some interest here, I'll, I'll punch out into this link that I posted over here, which apparently. Okay. But that means that the program itself is not stopped. It is just continuing. That is correct. So one of the nice things about BPF is that, you know, it, it doesn't allow you to mutate the state. 
Okay. Oh, it's like I accidentally checked on the binary. Uh, but anyways, so this is the full Go program. Uh, there's a lot of boilerplate, but basically this is the BPF C program that you just saw on the slides, um, which we actually send over as a string, right? Because it's, we're writing a C program that gets inserted into the, into, uh, the kernel eventually. Zen, do you want to zoom in a little bit? Oh, sorry. Yeah, and uh, there's one more question. Uh, Rangaswamy asks, uh, let me see, the registry is of type structure. Can you explain? I thought the registry will have key pair values always. So, okay. Yes, I will answer that question in one second. Uh, but before I do that, going back to the previous uh, question, sorry, I missed your name sure. when you asked. Um, but yeah, Narayan, I think, okay. So basically what happens in BPF is we take the C program and then down here, we basically, this is the, the code that actually attaches it. So we take the argument of which binary to attach it to, what the name of the function is, and then just some file descriptor that the kernel needs. So this is actually where we tie this function, right, to the actual function we're interested in. Does that, does that, uh, does that make sense? Uh, sure. Do we have a link to this? But okay. Uh, yes. So the link is on the, on the slide deck and I'll show a little demo of running this. Okay. There, yeah. you know, this, this stuff is, uh, BPF That's isn't good. the easiest thing to understand. <laughs> who is kind of between C and Go, so this is getting right. Uh, Ryan, I shared the link uh, to Zen's code in the chat. Okay, sure. Thank you so much. So also the BCC thing is like a, it's like a C Go module anyways. It's actually all, all C. Okay. Hey Zen, I have a question. Uh, so, uh, uh, this uh, Golang binary, right, and needs to enable the uh, uh, symbol table, right? Correct. The symbol table needs to be present in the binary for it to work. Um, so it will not work if you strip the binary. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, but the binary doesn't have to be a debug binary. It could be an optimized binary. It just has to have the symbol table. Mm -hmm. And uh, how is it uh, different from... Uh, Golang's uh, trace utility, which also depends on, uh, I mean, it uh, uses uh, some uh, trace system call. Uh, yeah, so, so trace probably uses like F trace or something, which are, which are usually a lot, it's usually a lot slower than using BCC. So part of the benefit of BCC is that you can take this, you know, relatively simple C code and then basically compile it into actual machine code that'll execute. So there's like no layers of interpretation because the kernel actually verifies that this program is safe to execute natively on the hardware. Mm -hmm. So how much performance input? I mean, whenever let's say, let's say we inserted a, a breakpoint, right? Or a, not a breakpoint, yeah. but an instrumentation point, right? Then how yeah. uh, actually the actual program uh, impacted because of this? So... It's, it's hard to know how much the actual program's impacted because it depends on how often the function is called, right? And how much work that function does. Um, so as a reference point at Pixie, we use this type of stuff all over the place. And if you trace every HTTP call on a reasonable web server, um, we can get, you know, our system has an overhead of like under 5%. Okay, okay, makes sense. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Yep. Please go. Okay, cool. So the next question was about how PT regs works and why isn't it a key key value pair? So keep in mind that the way BPF works is it's it's pretty low level, right? Um, and part of the reason is it's it's designed to be fast and it's designed to be verifiable uh, more than anything else. Um, and part of what happens over here is that we basically know that the registers have a point, is actually a pointer to the registers. So when you go into the context and actually look at the registers, 
all this is really telling is that the BPF program has to be able to go read that register. And when you compile the code, it'll generate the code necessary to read that register. So while you might think about the registers as like a key register value of the register, you know, it's actually like a physical hardware entity and you want to be able to, to access that easily. Did that, did that answer, answer your question? Okay. Uh, probably it is like this. Uh, the registry is the registry on the processor. The register that is, that is here is actually the register on the processor. That is, that is right. This is literally the CPU register. Uh, it's a little bit different because it's a CPU register when the program was called because the register file over here has already been mutated because of, you know, you're in a different function. Um, but it's a register as the state of the register file was when uh, the function, the previous function was called. Cool. Okay. I'll continue on. And if there are any questions, uh, you know, feel free to ask. Uh, so basically, as I said, this function will run every single time uh, main.computer is called. Uh, the registration is done by using these things called view probes, and you saw a little bit of that sample code when I switched over to it. Um, and the last thing to remember is that it basically will attach to every running version of the binary, uh, because what's happening is you're actually uh, patching, effectively patching that instruction in the binary and calling this function every time it happens. So with that in mind, I'll actually jump to a quick quick demo of this. Um, Interesting. Let me go over here. Okay, I'm gonna kill this real quick. All right, so I will make this bigger. Here we go. So here is the app.go uh, we have all been uh, hearing about so much. The first function here is compute e. And then there's func main, and it has a really simple HTTP handler on slash e that basically calls um, uh, uh, that calls compute e, right, right here. It says compute e iters. Okay. So with that in mind, I will just go ahead and run this binary, and then I'm going to go to this other terminal, and I will curl it. So if I curl it at one iteration, it says the value of E is two, which is, which is wrong. It's 2.7. Uh, two will also be wrong. With three, it gets to 2.5. And then five, it gets to 2.7. Uh, one of the things I guess I didn't remember is what happens when I don't specify an iteration. I actually don't remember what the value is. Okay. With that in mind, let's go take a look at the next program here, which is the tracer trace.go. So this is the program we just saw. Here's the BPF program that's 10 lines of code or so. Goes and grabs that register value, which is the input argument iterations, and then uh, submits it to the perf buffer. I want to quickly jump down here, here where we attach the probe and we say like grab this table called trace and then write the table called trace to this channel. And then the relevant part of the code is down here where we say read the value from the channel and then print it out, right? Mm -hmm. So we parse it as an N64. Uh, it's pretty hacky because I'm just like, hey, it's a little Indian N64. Uh, so don't don't try this on like a risk CPU, it won't work. But if you have a regular, regular Intel CPU, uh, it'll parse it as a little Indian N64 and then print it out. So with that in mind, let me run that program. So trace example, tracer. And then if you remember, we need to give it the actual binary. So this isn't the process ID of the actual binary. So we say, okay, this is a binary. Uh, it failed to load. It said operation not permitted. One of the things about BPF is you need to have privileges to run it. So I need to sudo into it. So I now am connected and there are no errors. So it's probably connected to the binary. So I'm going to run it without any value of iterations and see what happens. Okay. Turns out the default number is 100 because we see it over there. Um, I can curl it again with iterations equals five, and we'll actually see the value equals five uh, or 10. So, you know, this is pretty cool. I'm actually able to capture the values. There were no log statements in there. I'm using a separate program to effectively capture values in, in the other binary. Excellent. So I um, kind of have one more question. 
Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, why uh, do we need pseudo permission here at all? Because see, uh, we are kind of uh, uh, developers in the corporate world. So what it means is, I mean, in the commercial development. So there, when we get a computer, it uh, the the server we may not always have admin privileges. Yep. So the thing about BPF is because it allows you to inject code in the kernel. Um, you know, the kernel developers think it's important that uh, you have a certain. You actually don't necessarily need pseudo privileges if you follow like the regular like seccomp Linux rules. There are like certain specific privileges you need to, to insert certain BPF programs. So this one, I think, actually requires like uh, sysp trace access or something. Okay. Um, so basically, you need to have a certain level of privilege to access certain BPF features. Okay. Um, and partly because BPF allows you to work across, like I could monitor someone else's application. So, you know, I need to have some, some way of verify that I have enough access on this machine to do that. Okay. And uh, do you, uh, at least can you tell us what are the privileges that are required on a server uh, in order to run uh, BPF? Yeah, so it, it really it really depends on what you want to do. Uh, I'm pretty sure running this binary will require something called sysp trace, uh, which is one of the seccomp privileges. Um, and I think some of the other ones will require you know other privileges to access like network information. Okay, uh, maybe if you can list those privileges, that will be great because uh, we are. Uh, very few of us are uh, system programmers here. They are more or less, I mean, looking at the way audience is asking questions, we are more or less like um, application programmers. So Exactly. So if you say, yeah, so this talk is, it doesn't work, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> sorry, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this talk is a lot about like how BPF works under the hood. Um, okay. I, I think most people who work on BPF, like don't expect people to use this, right? Like, I think if you're trying to debug your program, um, it's very unlikely you're going to go write um, all this fun C code along with all the other wrappers and then, and then execute it, right? It's a lot of work to do. It's probably a lot easier for you to stick printfs and then run it. <laughs> um, so a lot of this is like, you know, it's like, oh, like this is cool. Like we can actually run code dynamically, capture data, without mutating the state. Um, the question really at that point becomes, uh, I actually do have uh, some talks about, so I, actually I'll continue on, it'll make sense. So I actually say over here, utilizing trace points for dynamic logging is, is, is easy in the sense that it works and you can do it in production binaries. The problem is I, I showed a very simple example, right? I'm like, hey, we can capture this in 64 value uh, being passed into the function. Um, it turns out if you actually try doing this for, more complex cases. It's not not nearly as much fun. Um, yeah. uh, what like about Go ABI like structs and pointers? If, Go pointers and things like that. Exactly. So the Go ABI actually makes this incredibly difficult to do, um, especially when you consider the fact that you have interfaces and channels and multi-layer structs. Um, so yes, this is cool, but it's basically impossible to use directly. Um, yeah, we, maybe we can have it uh, Q and A in the last after once we finish this off. Yeah, that is. Yep, sounds great. There's a lot of background sound from somebody. Hey, um, I have a question as well. Um, I don't know if I missed it because I missed some audio and screen. Uh, but. Uh, can you do this with a remote uh, container, uh, like uh, Docker running on Kubernetes? Or, I mean, I get you'd need privileges but, uh, for a namespace process. That kind of thing. That's, sorry, could you repeat the question? Can you do this with um, a remote uh, container, like Docker running on Kubernetes, that kind of thing? And yeah, so one of the things... Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that happens with eBPF is that it runs on the machine. 
So it is possible to do it. You can run a privileged container and then insert BPF code and then monitor it. Uh, actually, with that with that in mind, uh, I'll actually just go into uh, what I call um, our, our shameless plug over here, uh, which is part of what we are trying to do at at Pixie is actually make stuff like this super easy to do. Because um, like as you know, everyone called out this stuff you know looks easy, but under the hood, it actually starts getting pretty complicated. So what do you want to do if you just want to be able to stick like a printf in this function dynamically because you're trying to log production code and you want to get function arguments, the input outputs, and the latencies, right? Um, it's a lot of work for you to go and like write all this like custom BPF code. Um, so I'll actually do like a very quick, like, I don't know, 30 second demo with how, how Pixie does this. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to go to this other thing, which is online boutique, which I don't know if anyone's seen, but it's like an application for, to run uh, a distributed application on Kubernetes. Um, oh, sorry, I was thinking I was accidentally muted for a second. Uh, okay, so with this, you can go shopping, you can click on an item, add it to cart, you know, place an order and buy it. So one of the things you want to do in this application is, you know, if you have any trouble, you want to be able to debug it. There's this entire service called the checkout service uh, written in Go. And there is a part of the service that deals with money transactions. So we scroll down over here and we notice that there's a function that sums money. Um, and summing money basically means takes, you know, the left to right value of money over here and then returns another value of money. And, you know, it's, it's not as simple as just doing addition because, uh, it deals with, with currencies and it also deals with like different, uh, you know, does like the fixed math to make sure that money's handled correctly. So what I'm actually going to quickly do over here is I'll run into, uh, run into Pixie, um, and in you know, a Pixie, you can basically navigate through and find online boutique. And in online boutique, we can find the checkout service. And this is like, you know, someone mentioned there's a pod, which is basically some program that's running inside of some container. Uh, we identify every process with this unique ID. So I can grab the unique ID for this thing. And I have a little debug program over here. Uh, I won't dump, go into the details just yet, uh, but let me just show you what happens first. Uh, I will execute this. This program will actually deploy the trace points. Um, sorry, it takes a few seconds. And we notice that there's no data, uh, but that's because we haven't been doing anything. So I will go back to online boutique and I will try to buy this camera. And then I'll place an order over here. If I go back, I'll actually see the money function got called. This is the go routine ID. If you remember L and R and then the return value. So one of the questions that someone asked is how does this work with structs? Uh, well, we actually in our system actually chase all the pointers uh, to be able to go find all the struct values. So L units is actually L dot units, the struct value. So a little bit under the hood um, since you know uh, we're all developers here is that we basically say that there is a PX trace, go probe, give it the path to the function we're interested in, and then just give us a list of arguments to, to go find. And we'll basically go find all the values and you can list them out with the uh, struct notation. Um, and that, that's it. That was uh, my uh, shameless plug for, for Pixie over there. So it, it's, you know, it's free for everyone to try out and um, we're pretty active on our GitHub. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention is there are other related projects that, that work on tracing and BPF. Um, Kim Wilk, uh, we, know, we know them really well. They work on this thing called Inspector Gadget. And then Sysdig um, has a lot of eBPF-based uh, stuff. So that's all, that's all I had. And I'm happy to take more questions. And thanks a lot for, uh, uh, for listening to, to the talk. Thank you, Jen. That was a great talk. Uh, let me, uh, so I have uh, uh, a lot of participants to unmute themselves. Uh, they can, if you have any question, feel free to raise your hand and we can uh, question one by one. Yeah.
uh in the chat i think there is one question uh, regarding uh, like how does this work with the stu and self defense um so it doesn't actually service meshes don't actually matter for us because we basically go find the binary and then can insert the tracing logic directly into the binary of the go program Hi, Zeng. Uh, this is Ranga here. This is related to the earlier question on registry. Uh, so, how does the probe know uh, for a particular processor uh, what is the uh, registry type is going to look like? Because it can vary from processor to processor, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And if you go look at the code, it's uh, full of if defs that get pulled in when uh, the program compiles. Okay, so it's going to loop in and check if it matches that. Oh, it's, it's a lot less sophisticated than that. So this is actually part of the reason that it's hard to pre-compile BPF programs and then submit them because they actually rely on using the kernel headers uh, with the if defs to figure out like all these values when you run the, when you compile it. Okay. So uh, that being said, um, uh, when I'm writing a new probe, I'll have to know for this particular processor, uh, what is the matching uh, registry type is going to look like, or is it already pre-compiled and given to me? So basically there's a bunch of if defs. So as long as you're on the right processor, you can get the values and things like the stack pointer and stuff. I think they have macros to pull those out. Oh, okay. 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 Great. So they'll always pull out the stack pointer value regardless of, you know, uh, what processor you're running on. Okay. And uh, to the uh, one which you just answered on the service mesh, right? So I just want to understand, uh, so you had a Kubernetes cluster, uh, which was getting debugged with eBPF, right? So yep. with Istio, uh, pretty much I can do a service level uh, micro uh, debugging of my calls. Uh, so how does that compare with eBPF? I mean, I know eBPF is more kernel level, um, so it depends. I think there's a couple of things, right? With service meshes like Istio, you actually have to have Istio deployed, which not everyone does. Um, eBPF is available in pretty much any kernel that's 4.0 you know, and above. So it's been available for a while now, uh, for at least the past couple of years. So it's a lot easier to get software deployed when you don't have to carry around like, like having a dependency like Istio, which actually requires a fair amount of work to insert. Uh, mm -hmm. The second thing is Istio is typically around like capturing the network traffic with BPF. You can capture network traffic, but you can also do things like, you know, the stuff we showed where you can look at an arbitrary function and get, you know, variables out of an arbitrary function. Okay. Okay. And uh, to the other related projects, like from Kinvoke, they also uh, catered to eBPF kind of a scenario or is it like a different stream altogether? Um, so Kinvoke, I don't know if they only do eBPF stuff, but they do a lot of eBPF stuff. Okay. Uh, I think most of their recent work is around eBPF. They're very active in the eBPF community. And, uh, your entity Pixie Labs, they help us, uh, implement this eBPF in a faster and user friendly way. Is that right? Yeah. So Pixie is basically, um, a way to help like go, go uh, software developers, like use eBPF along with other technologies. So we're kind of like this umbrella system that sits on top of any, any Kubernetes cluster automatically captures a bunch of information. Um, it, it takes like 30 seconds to install. We'll automatically instrument everything and oh. then grab, grab data. Yeah. And, and then there's a pretty sophisticated like querying system and visualization on top of it. Any enterprise currently adopting this? Uh, yes, there are actually quite a, uh, quite a few, like fairly large companies in the, in the United States that are using it. Oh, great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Then there's a question in the chat. Uh, does BPF create an, create a FD for accessing kernel pointers like in Linux kernel modules? 
Uh, so any, any BPF probe that you insert, you do get a file descriptor for it. So the, the U probe being inserted, the first thing you actually do is you say like, I want to create a U probe file descriptor. And then you say, you want to attach a U probe to this function. So uh, thank you, Jan. Thank you, Sean, for taking the session for all of us. Uh, in case uh, guys, you have any question, feel free. Uh, I will suggest Ishan and Jan to have their some contact in, in the chat. So if in case people have more question to follow up where they can contact you. And yeah, I can just put my email on there too. Um, and also, I think we're both on the Slack. Oh yeah, in the Gopher Slack itself, right? Uh, exactly. Yeah. So maybe you can drop your uh, Gopher Slack email. Uh, sorry, username, so that people can ping you over there too. Yep. I don't know what Ishan's is. I'm sure mine is uh, Z Asgar. I think Ishan just pinged in the Bangor Slack channel. Then. Yeah, I'll I'll just ping on there so you can see it. Uh, thanks. Sorry, uh, Ankur muted me. Uh, you can also ping us on uh, Slack, uh, our Pixies Slack channel. Uh, we're, uh, so we are, we have about 140 people. Uh, you can ping us there. Zen and I will be customer support there. So anytime you ping us, we'll help you out. Thanks. Thank you, Jen. Yep. Thanks, that, everyone. Uh, yeah. So we will have our second session from Murali. It's uh, for the HTTP package. Over to you, Murali. Uh, hi, guys. Can you hear me? Yes, Murali, we can hear you. Cool, cool. Yeah, so. Thanks, Ankur, and uh, hi, everyone. So myself, Nurali, and uh, yeah, I will be giving a talk on uh, uh, HTTP package in uh, Go. So yeah, let's start. So let me share my screen. Hope you are able to see my screen. Uh, just uh, like uh, we will, uh, the, the session is about a little bit of coding and demo. And along with that, we'll try to understand uh, some of a uh, couple of uh, uh, functionality HTTP package is providing to us. So yeah, uh, I'm I, I'm working currently with the Gojek. Uh, I'm based out of Bangalore, and yeah, uh, in day-to-day -day work, I use Go from last two to three years, and like uh, yeah. So let's uh, start our demo stuff. So this is the demo uh, uh, program. So we have on the right hand side, the server program. And on the left hand side, we have the client program. Uh, I will be just uh, running server like uh, in uh, this HTTP is mainly about web server, right? So we need to write a web server. We need to start some coding on the web server and we need to uh, call that web server functionality. So all the functionality which we are going to Right for a web server will be running on uh, this side of uh, right side of the uh, screen, and uh, whatever we are going to call on the web server will be running on the left side of the screen. And the code on the right side of the screen is the server code, and code on the left side left side screen is the client code. I kept some of the code just for like a debugging uh, or print sort of statement, but yeah. So if you uh. If you have any question, you can ask. Otherwise, I have like uh, fragmented this particular session in demo one, demo two, demo three kind of things. So once my demo one is over, I will just check on the chat if there are any questions. Uh, yeah, so let's not waste more time and rest run it. So let me run my server. My server is actually just printing that I'm server and let me run my client. And I'm just saying that I'm client. So let me just implement my server because this actually should not stop. This should 
wait for a request to come. So how we will do in the Go? So if you just say this is HTTP, so this is the package which have all the functionality, and I will just say listen send so. So I just need to call this guy, and I need to just pass. Okay, I want to listen to one. So this is the local host it is pointing to, and 8080 port, usual, fine, and have a link. And now if I run this guy, then it will hold. It means that it is listening on the 8080 port on the local host. So I can actually call these things. So I need to modify this guy, but let me just try with a curl. I can also do fine. So if I just say local host. So it is at least responding and it's saying that it's page not found. So for example, if this is not there, okay, uh, means uh, th we have started the server. So it's saying that it is page not found. So let's me just uh, implement some of the uh, handler or pages for this particular uh, server. So how would I will do it? So I will say HTTP handler um, and I will just say pattern. So I want to call this pattern, which is like, uh, this is my pattern, which is just a slash. So on this slash, when you call, let me just say, okay, let's uh, call this home handler. Okay, so what is this home handler? I need to implement this home handler, which will be a func called home handler. And uh, uh, if you see the syntax of this particular guy, when you want to register any handler, you need to have this particular signature. So just let me just uh, copy this signature and just paste it here okay and let me give the name so this is a writer this is from http package okay and this is a reader uh, this is the request and this is from http package and now you can see that the error is gone so now i'm actually handling this less and let me run this particular so i'm just uh, writing some uh, debugger statement that okay you have called the home handler Okay, and let me read on my code. So my server is now serving this and let me just do it. So it has written nothing, but it has called home handler, right? So let me see what is happening. So if I just say put, then it is returning 200 okay. So before it was returning 404, now it is returning 200 okay. But it is not printing any uh, uh, return value because we are not replying any, uh, we are not uh, doing anything on this one. So actually I want to just print hello world. Okay, so let's just write hello world. Uh, so you can just say, this is my response is equal to hello world, fine. And I will just say, I want to write a fight of response. And if I just now rerun my, this guy, okay. And if I run these things, then I will get this hello world. Okay. so. I, I hope you understand this thing. So you just start a server on 8080. You register one uh, handler on a path slash. So whatever you call on this slash, it will actually do. And now you put here whatever, it will call the same handler because you have not registered any more handler other than this. And uh, this this is the pattern matching happening. So it will actually give. So any anything you call, it's fine. I okay. So it will it will call the same handler. And that's six. So we are currently doing with this uh, curl, but let's do it on the client. So uh, when you are writing your web server, okay, you will be writing this particular part of the code. So you will be starting your server, but now you want to consume this particular thing. See, generally you can consume this. So if your website is uh, the backend is go, okay, then uh, you can just directly call here like this way, or you can also go to the browser fine and let me just go to the browser and let me just uh, call this guy right so i can just say localhost 8080 so this will also work it will return me hello world fine but where do i need to write uh, so now i'm going to the client code so why i need to write this client code so let me first write the client code and then i will uh, come to that point. So I, I, on the client side, I will just say HTTP and there is this function called get and I just need to put this particular guy, right? I will just control insert and I will just say paste and it will give me something called response and error. Okay. And uh, I will just, uh, let me just ignore the error for now. And I will just say 
I, I have some some nice. Uh, uh, I have written already a function which actually process the response, which just print the whatever is coming. So now instead of writing call, let me just run this particular my client. So this is my client, and my client has called this guy, and you say hello what is printed. So let me just clear my screen. Let me run once again, and it is calling this home handler. So this is where we are actually writing a client code, uh, where we are calling a HTTP server. Uh, in real life, where do we write this kind of call? Like this particular server is an API, is providing some API, and you want to call that third-party API from your web application. Say for example, Paytm is there, so Paytm wants to uh, make a call to HDFC to do some transaction, for example. So this uh, my client would be. Uh, you can assume that Paytm would be having this code base, and uh, this my server. You can say that uh, uh, SDFC would be having this particular code base. So from uh, Paytm code base, it will call this SDFC directly API, and it will actually does the work. So hope when when we write this client code in Go is clear to you guys. Uh, otherwise, if you don't want something like so, this is more about service to service communication, or you can say third party API call kind of things. In case of microservice architecture, you will actually write a client code, uh, this sort of code, to talk to another service. Okay, so you have two services in your microservice architecture. One is a uh, one will return you the customer, and other will return you the order history of the customer. So that customer service may call that order history kind of things. Uh, that's where this kind of kind of things happens. Fine. So cool. So this is how we'll write. So there are some other way we can write this particular things. So there is something called. Uh, so uh, HTTP providing us one something called default client, and you can directly call that particular here. And if you can run your stuff, so that also will work. See, I'm just trying to cover most um, more and more HTTP functionality, uh, so that you will get more idea on this. Right. So if you just go here, the previous way, and if you go inside that one, they are actually calling default client only. So which we can directly do it here. So this is the simple demo program where you have server, you have client, and yeah, this is the very basic of uh, HTTP uh, packages uh, and their functionality. So this is my first part of the first demo. Okay. So what we have learned. So it's like uh, we have seen what is this. Uh, Handler func, okay. So you can see that with handler func, we have actually register our handler. Then listen and serve is the one where we started our server. On the client side, we have used HTTP get or we have used default client with get, and this is response body. So I I have actually done this process response. If you see that things, then it is actually it is actually whatever from response it is reading reading the body, and it is just printing the body here, okay, and which is what we see here. So these are the some of the stuff which we have covered in uh, demo one. Okay, let me see if there are any chat. May I know what ID is this? This is VS Code. Go to gracefully stop the server. How to gracefully stop the server? Uh, yeah, I means uh, you need to uh, listen on to some uh, OS signals and all. But yeah, those are not I'm going to cover here. uh because i'm so so some of the things you will see here it's not like the perfect way of uh, doing a productive code but my idea is to actually introduce you more and more http functionality so that uh, you understand what are the features available and then you can use it but whatever i'm going to demo it here it will be like very like a uh, overview kind of things uh we can handle symptom yeah and shut down these things is a go server is a multi Threaded server, yeah. So this is a good question. So let me just. Uh, so in Go, there is something called Go routines. Okay. So let me just uh, clear this guy. So let me just run this one. So currently, this particular uh, server is uh, waiting on one Go routine. So it is listening. It is halted itself to listen on one of the Go routine. When you get, when you make, when a client make a request, it will come to the server. So for this home handler, so. what it will do this guy will take the control of that particular request and it will create another go routine and it will actually delegate the running of this home handler 
to the go routines so um, each so if you are making another call it will go to another go routine and once it is complete this home handler is complete that go routine will go out of life so in uh, in go like uh, uh, you can have like so many thousands or millions of go routine running so you can actually concurrently handle millions of uh, request and yeah i also seen that 5000 per second and 10000 more than that is actually very easy to handle with the http server i'm talking about the basic http server fine actually more than that but yeah i don't have a number but yeah it is a multi threaded in that sense and the, all those go routine will run in parallel cool so if there are no more any question we can uh, move it to the next section uh, where we will uh, go for the next level of functionality so this is just returning uh, hello world but i want to actually return something more so because that is what uh, the part of the demo so you will say that i have something called flipkart kind of uh, company and i have something like a view items okay and i have something called buy items kind of functionality okay and let me just return those things so i will just return my server i will just call and i am getting those things cool so let me just uh, go to the next uh, demo where i want to say okay i want to implement this view items fine so whenever like a uh, view items so whenever this call is made to the items it will actually re return me the list of items so similar stuff i need to do the same things i need to have a handler with the same signature okay but i can't have same name so let me just make it items and let me just make it here items so now i can actually uh, yeah cool so let me rerun this guy and so if i just do this curl uh, so i will just do this then i will return that flipkart wala stuff then if i just do this i will still return some uh, uh, empty response because we are not returning anything here so let me return the item so let me just copy paste some code to make this things faster so i will explain those code so show yeah so i have just taken one item struct which has id name and price so just see that all are uh, uh, capital starting with capital so all are public and then i created one dummy like this is my database store you can say fine where i have two records for item and i just want to return this item then how i would do that very simple so i uh, i will just say json dot uh, marshall okay i will just pass this code items and i will get this response i will get this error let me ignore this error for now just for a demo purpose and just whatever i am doing here i will just write this to uh, okay so this is what what all i am doing fine so let me see how it works so let me run my class uh, and just i am running so i see that i have got all these things so these are my item there is item i001 i002 mobile laptop and their prices okay and i am getting all these things here so this is what my item handler uh, i don't bother about uh, explaining these things because this is a json package and you can this is a very preliminary way of uh, converting your uh, go object to a json string but yeah there are some nicer way to do that things and that should be used in production but this is very minimal uh, and you can do like this and it will return you response which is nothing but the array of byte which you can directly write and you will what is get it here but uh, let me just call this guy from here fine so this is i'm calling it from curl i can call this guy from this things fine so let me just uh, enable this okay so i will close this sometimes and let me do this so this is my uh, home okay and now this is my items okay so how i will do so i am introducing a new functionality now so there is something called http called new request so where you will actually able to create a new request okay so because uh, yeah let's see so this is a get request which we will want to make so i will just say the method is get okay what next it is asking it's asking for me url so url would be this right okay and last thing what it is asking me 
is to pass a body and i don't want to pass a body because it's a get function and that's it i will get request i will say error okay i will just let me ignore the error and need to have this guy and whatever okay this should be request cool and like like i will do like something different this time it's called client dot do so this is a function where in in the client http client where you can just pass your request and at least it will execute that things and it will return you a response and a error and i want to ignore the error for now so you see here we are directly calling http get that also we can do but i am now doing in a two step way so you will have new dot http new dot request and then you have a request object and you will just say client dot do and execute the request why you would do that because you have this request object and if you want some more things to be set so you can set all these things fine so if you want to set some headers okay so that's what you can just set it via this things fine so you can add some header from here uh, in this things you can you can't do this things because you are not getting the request object so i have done this things and let's again process me the response and let me run this guy now i am running the my client fine yeah my client is running and it is actually give me this particular stuff which is nothing but our uh, response for the items fine so let me just uh, put some so that we can distinguish something like okay, this is what is happening just put it over here fine okay so so you can see that uh, the, this is the first call which is just like uh, on the home screen and this is for the items and we have worked this items uh, one more thing i want to cover in this particular demo just assume that i want to i want to just uh, so there are so many items like uh, th there are item these are all te technology related items and then you will be having something like home appliance home appliance related items and all that things and whenever this guy is calling item you just want that whatever the category they want to see the items we just return those items so how we will do that so say for example i am just talking like this way fine right? here you can just pass something called category and if you pass tech okay so currently like it is returning the things but how you will uh, process this particular category in your server fine right? so let me just uh, modify my this guy so i will just say that r dot so this is a query parameter so i will get it out of url and i will say get and i will i want to say what is category value and i will just say category okay and uh, i will just let me just print uh, category as of now and nothing doing anything more than that okay so yeah let me just run this guy once again let me rerun my server for sure okay and uh, let me rerun this things and you will see now there is a category tech is actually good so i am just uh, coming to the fact saying that okay whatever this particular thing you are passing as a query parameter you will actually able to extract it via this and once you have a category you can run your logic that out of this item which item you want to actually send it and which you don't want to send it and if person does not find uh, passing any category then you will send all the items but uh, that is not i am going to cover now but uh, what i am going to cover is like you can pass from here also category is equal to tech okay and let me run my client okay so when i call my client uh, still you see that this item equal to tech is there so let me say tech on x tech okay so now so it has come with the x tech fine right? so this is how you will pass the parameter uh, this is called query parameter so yeah this is sort of my second demo kind of thing so you can see that uh, uh, in the second demo we have understand on the server side how we can use this uh, query a parameter how we can yeah i want to just pass uh, this particular thing so i also want to say that if category is equal to blank fine then i just want to throw an error so without category you can't do that so this see this is another another new uh, function i'm calling from http so this is http there is something called error and i just need to pass my response 
and then I need to pass the error. So I will just say the error is missing category. Okay. And what is the code? So I will say HTTP internal. So I will just status internal server error and I will just say return. What I'm doing now that if you are not pro providing me the category, I will return an error. So there is a nicer way. There is a shortcut way to you generate error using HTTP dot error function. And you will just pass what is the error code and what is the missing category. So let me read on this guy and let me just, uh, so let me pass the category first. So it should work because the category is passed here and let me now remove the category. Okay. And let me run it now. And it will say that, okay, this category was a blank. So I got this error code called 500 and error is missing category. Now how to extract this error code. So whatever the response, which we are getting here, fine. Okay. It is going to process response and it is calling something called check code. So this is, I've already written. So it is uh, saying that it responds to status code. So you see, this is another uh, thing in the HTTP. So HTTP has response is one of the stuff. And within the response, there is something called status code, which you will actually get the HTTP status code. And if it is not 200, which is like not okay, then actually you will write this particular and you will exit the program. That is what is happening here. So what you are writing, you are writing status code and you can also write status message. Okay. So those sort of things, you will get it out of this particular demo. So that's what uh, on server side, we have used HTTP error. On client side, we have written a new request. We have used this method get. You see this on the client side, fine. Uh, we have used this uh, new request. We have used this method get, correct? And then we have do client.do. We have done client.do, fine. In response, we have understood status code and status, fine. So this is a part of second demo. So yeah. So basically, if you see, uh, if you go to the net and if you see this particular uh, stuff, uh, so this is the HTTP package, okay, uh, from Go, and this is the documentation of HTTP package. So you will see that they have a lot of functions, they have a lot of types. So say, for example, this request is one of the type, fine. Response is one of the type. So we are actually, uh, in response, you will find that uh, all uh, different stuff is there. Similarly, in case of request also, you will find a lot of stuff is there, fine. So we are just covering something one by one uh, in our demo, okay? So these are all from HTTP only. And this is my part of second demo. Let me just see what are the questions. So on the client side, the error itself come out as a body of the response. Yeah, so when you do these things, it is go as a body, okay? Okay, if you go and set the function, then it, it will say that, okay, they have they, they are writing this particular error into the body. And uh, you can also get this status, which is, uh, I have not printed it here. So for example, you can also print the status. So this is the body and I just want status is equal to modular as, and I just want to print this particular guy called uh, response.status. And let me run this guy right, right now. And what it is returning so okay uh, yeah because uh, the status uh, you said this is this is the internal server error you see this is the extra thing coming uh, due to these things right so status equal to 500 okay we have printed this status and this is the status right so in status the status message will go which will be nothing but this kind of message which will give you what is this 500 code is all about Status code will return you exit code. So this is the code. And in the body, you will find this particular error, which is like error missing category, which is what we put at it here. But this is what HTTP error does. It's your, uh, it's your is how you would like to do. So in the, in the production code, we will write this error in the uh, JSON code format, something like that. We will not under, just return this missing category, but we will also return an error code. So you can also say that this is my error 001. Okay, so customer just need to say that, okay, uh, I'm getting error ERR001 and we understand that why we are getting these things. Okay, so this is also like one of the way. Yeah, anything more? So on the client side, looks like the HTTP error automatically puts at the end of this response. Yeah, yeah, cool. So this is the second demo. Uh, let's uh, move it to the third demo.
So I think I have covered everything. Let me just close check. Check, 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 check. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So let me just move you to the third demo. So uh, in third demo, uh, yeah, I think we are doing a bit of time. Okay. See, basically, uh, this particular things like uh, there are so so many sophistication required when you want to actually register your different handler like. In your web application, you will be having hundred handler, and some will be for get call, some will be for method call. So for those sophistication, uh, HTTP is provided. So this is another new functionality called new server mux. Okay, so this is the server mux, which is like server. Uh, this is the uh, this is the uh, doing a routing of the handling uh, handler routing. So let me just get these things. So what you can do, you can actually remove this guy. Okay. And you can go with this router, okay. And in router, you can actually uh, add these things, okay. Let me just copy paste these things, okay. And I just remove, uh, replace this HTTP with router, okay. So now you have full control on how you want to uh, process these particular things using this router, okay. And you can do more on that. Now one more thing we need to change is that we are passing this nil here. We need to now pass the router. Okay, and uh, everything will work same. Okay, okay, so everything is working. So let me just uh, remove this particular error. So yeah, so thing so things are going fine. So this is one of the chain. So this server mix. If you see, then it is currently returning this uh, server mux uh, struct. But uh, say for example, you can just uh, create another struct and you can just uh, uh, wrap this struct and in your new struct, you can actually provide a lot of functionality. Say for example, if you have come across this something called uh, uh, Gorilla Mux find, new router. So there is a, if you are using this uh, Gorilla uh, library for uh, doing this, your HTTP routing, then you have this, Mux dot new router, and if you go to the implementation, it is not. It is doing similar thing what this server mux is doing. Fine. So actually, you can enhance this server mux, or you can write your own router on your own. But ultimately, you will say that there are a lot of functionality which is actually uh, common in this particular server mux, uh, Gorilla mux, and server mux. But because both are them for the same purpose. So this is like something more internal to the language. You, in your production, you will be directly using something like this Gorilla library, or there are some other libraries, and they have a lot of sophistication is there, fine. But how they have implemented is using this, nothing but this particular functionality of this particular server marks. So this is the end of server marks uh, explanation. Now let me do one more change on my server side, where I want to now comment this guy. Okay, so we, before we have commented, we have these things and we have replaced this with these things, fine. Now I have this particular thing, I replace this with something called server and I have something called http.server. So this is another uh, functionality, HTTP server is another type and what I need to do here, I need to pass handler and now I will be passing what? Router, whatever router I pass. See, I'm replacing this guy with this. So I need to press the router here. And this particular guy thinks I need to pass here, nothing but the address, okay? And now I'm done. So what I will be doing, server dot listen and serve. So you can just see the stuff. This particular stuff is coming here. It is passing two argument. We are not passing it there, but we are creating this particular object and we are passing this there and that's it. Okay, so let's run these things and then we'll see why we are doing this and everything works it means that this this is fine so why you will actually have this particular thing so if you go inside this serve you can actually pass tls config so if you want to pass your certificate related things so if you have your this is your http server fine but if you want a https server then you have this uh, those things you can put the read timeout like you can actually uh, control the behavior of your server right timeout so if your uh, server is actually running slow then you can, it can terminate the call uh, very fast and not like uh, waiting for one request to get complete. So there are so many functionality you will get. 
and it is your wish whether you want to use those functionality then if you want your tls to be set okay you go here and provide a tls config fine and you can now write your tls config here where you have your certificate and you will give your certificate details but if you don't want that you can still stay with it like this and this is also going to work cool uh, so this is one part of the demo 3 uh, there are some enhancement which we did on the server side let me see if there are any question no question so similarly instead of using this there is a issue with this particular default client so say for example uh, i am calling this uh, stuff and i am putting something called time dot sleep so i am just putting this 5 into time dot second so just say that i am putting this sleep means when you call this particular guy it will wait for 5 5 second and then it will return the response and now let me run my this guy so you will see that okay okay yeah uh, because uh, i am what happened why it is not working for us okay i need to restart my server right and let me now run this guy so you see that it is waited for 5 second and this guy is also waiting for 5 second and this is running and this is coming back so this this is fine like uh, because it take 5 second but just under assume that it is taking 60 second or just assume that it is taking 60 minutes fine and if you just uh, like call this guy it will wait for 60 minute and your like client is and fine so how you will get around this so in your production you will never use this particular guy okay what you will be using instead is you will be creating your own client this is nothing but like this way so there is http.client okay so this is a struct available and you will just put timeout equal to so you can decide what timeout is preferable for you so i want my response in 2 second if it is not coming in 2 second i just don't want to go ahead so let me just run this things so you can see that still it is waiting for 60 minute and let me run it so wait it for 1 2 and it is gone fine so uh yeah this is fine this is fine okay i think i am not checking error here that's why so let me check the error error and this is the thing and let me run this okay so one two and it will terminate okay i need to check what is going wrong here but ultimately you see that uh, actually after 2 seconds it is actually uh, your 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 yeah here i need to put okay 1 2 and it is terminated nicely fine so it just say that this time out exceeded while awaiting for headers so uh, you can create this http client and you can put a time out and the time out is your request time out so every request which you are making here it will wait for 2 second and if it is not coming the response in 2 second it will terminate itself okay i am terminating the program but you will at least terminate the call fine uh, ab ab apart from this uh, client there is something called transport uh, which is http so this is these are the things you are going to use on the client side okay transport and then uh, let me just copy paste this guy from here how does it look like okay and okay so yeah then use uh, let me use this transport here so i have created something called transport and i am passing this transport to client now what this transport is for this transport is for uh, handling tcp connection so this is at the http level you can actually do http request timeout but uh, this transport is about actual making a tcp connection to the server and they have something called dialer this also used for a tcp connection stuff so here there is a timeout you see so this timeout is about uh, creating a new means when you create a tcp connection it will first do a uh, one uh, acknowledgement like that okay both client and server are ready to start the communication and if that starting that initialize initialize things if it is taking more than 5 second it will terminate the things so this i can't demo because in this uh, i my server has to be very slow kind of things uh, but this is that 5 seconds and this is the stale hansa timeout so if you are doing http as communication 
at that time you are like uh, those things will happen in uh, when you do pass your certificate they will handshake will happen so they will actually uh, check that certificate are right or not and all that things fine so um, yeah so there you will actually write this particular timeout things and this is your total timeout for a request so generally you can put something like uh, 10 second for here okay something like that so i'm not i'm not going into the details what will be the ideal uh, timeout you need to put but i'm just putting saying that this is your request timeout total request timeout this is only for tcp connection this is for tcp handshake uh, in your production you will go till this level you will never go to this level fine where you will go to this level if you are writing some router yourself okay router i am talking about proxy like you are in the making of the proxy business you are writing reverse proxy like ha proxy is one of the things if you are writing uh, go uh, ha proxy in go at that time you will use this transport and all the things like how much time it will try, uh, take to maximum take to create a tcp connection and handshake and all the things but yeah this is what uh, part of third demo so in demo 3 we have just uh, uh, understand this uh, server marks within the server no not the server marks but yeah i made some mistake here uh, yeah yeah i think yeah server marks only yeah server marks and listen and serve on the server and on the client side we have understand transport and client and their time out fine let me just cross check if anything else is missing yeah server timeout security certificate yeah so here uh, one last thing is that so say for example you want to pass the security certificate fine so you also will be having tls config here so this is the clear tls client config and you will be passing a similar thing called tls dot config so here you will be having certificate okay so this is on the client side. We have seen on the server side, but this is on the client side. So when you want to pass this uh, uh, your certificate, you will be using this particular transport fine. So that's it for the demo three. Let me see. Okay, there are no more issue, uh, new question. But hope this is getting clear, fine. So now we are going towards our last demo, and where I won't be writing the code, I will be just copy pasting, and I will be just. But if you have any question, you can ask. Cool. So uh, this is demo three. Let me just start with the demo four. So see, uh, this is my flip card. I have done view items, fine. So I'm able to now, let me just uh, make everything nice. So I will remove these things and everything is now working fine. Okay, so I'm a, I just said that, so just imagine that uh, uh, I log into the flip card website. So I got that uh, in flip card, these are the menu. Like you can see, view the item, you can buy the items. Then you choose, I want to view the items. So you have got list of all the items. Now you want to say, I want to buy the items. When you want to say, I want to buy it, means you will add into your cart. And at the time it will ask for a login. Okay. Why they want it? Because say, for example, uh, let me first uh, implement this buy items kind of uh, functionality. So let me copy paste the code for now. Okay. So I'm just uh, for buy items, I need to obviously add one more uh, handler and you see that I'm just hand, uh, adding in a somewhat different way. So there are some uh, uh, way you can actually like, like there are handle func, handle all things are there in uh, uh, how you will register your handler. So you can just look into those things, but ultimately I need to implement this by handler. So let me copy paste by handler code. Okay. So I, uh, uh, let me push this code here and let me remove this guy for now. Cool. So they want something called order. So let me copy this order uh, struct, which I have it here. And let me explain you everything before going ahead. See, what is this buy uh, handler is all about? Okay. It will just say that uh, you want to buy some stuff then you will pass this your order details and how your order details looks like is like you are passing IDD, ID and quantity. So if you want this particular guy and if you want two, two quantity of this uh, particular thing, then here ID would be I001 and quantity would be two. 
and uh, let me just start my server now restart my server and yeah from here let me just do a call with the buy so yeah so here i'm let me just first do the buy uh, with a call so uh, i'm just calling this buy okay you can see i'm calling this buy and i'm passing our payload which is like my id is i001 and our quantity is 2 and let me do a post so in buy handler it has uh, actually grabbed this particular uh, request and what it is doing it is actually unmarceling so this is the reverse of marcel in marcel you will convert go object into json in unmarcel you will convert your uh, whatever your body which is in json to a go object and then i am printing what is order id and order quantity so you will see that whatever i am passing here i am getting so if i want to pass this 3 okay i am getting it 3 but now let me just come to this particular say for example i made this call okay so i said that i want to buy order uh, i001 and 2 and then i will say that uh, i want to buy another con uh, item called this things now you see that uh, when you are uh, when you are like it may be possible that this call request is coming from user 1 like your flipkart user 1 and this request is coming from user 2 so you don't know that in which card user 1 card you need to add this or user 2 card you need to add this or both you need to add into user 1 that is where we need something called session and uh, for session, we just need to make first of all login. So whenever like you are going with this uh, this sort of functionality, fine. Like you are you item buy items. Before that, you will actually ask your user to login. So as soon as you will actually try to uh, add uh, item into your uh, card, it will ask say okay first you need to login and you need to tell your credential. So let me first implement this uh, login uh, handler. So for that another I need is login handler. See, we are actually going uh, building one business app kind of things, right? It's like a one standard shopping cart app, fine. And I have now login. It's not production grade, but it is actually the, 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 the scenario is production, fine. It's real life production stuff, fine. Uh, so uh, I have actually written one login handler. Okay, what it wants, it wants you to pass the login credential, fine. So let me just call this guy here. Okay. So I'm not using curl. Let me just use my go client. This login handler is registered here. Okay. And login stuff is here. And this right here. So let me rerun my this client server, my running with the login uh, functionality. And let me copy paste the client side of the login, calling login. Fine. So this will call the login. Okay, so what it is doing, it is actually calling this login, right? This is what we wanted, right? Okay, and uh, it is passing this, you see now, uh, you have created this request. Okay, and now I, we are coming into the use case where we actually want to use this request object. You see, I am setting request.set basic code. So if you just pass that, okay, this is my username and this is my password. Okay, set basic code, username and password. Okay, kind of things. Then what it will do? It will actually set into header authorization and it will put this basic authentication way. So I'm just passing this username neurally password ABCD and I'm making the request to this particular guy login handler. My login handler is running. So let me run this guy. So client, I'm running my client now. And you will say that uh, the login call, it is actually successfully completed because login handler has come. We have passed only the username and password, but you see that I'm printing this authorization. So I'm in login handler, I'm taking this authorization header and I'm printing that authorization header. And you will see that it is coming in the basic uh, authorization uh, format. Okay. And what else I'm doing? Because I told that we need to have a session so that when two by request is coming, we should come to know that whether it is coming from user one or user two. Here my user is neurally. So we need to just create a session for Neurally. So how I'm creating a session. So I'm just like uh, creating a cookie. Okay. So this is a cookie way of main maintaining the session. So cookie, you see HTTP is another uh, stuck provided in HTTP package where you will say, I want to create a cookie. 
what is the name it is the session id because i'm going to put a session id what is the value value i'm just putting s hyphen uh, some nanosecond which is the current time so you will say that it is s hyphen some random number has been put it this is my session id and that i'm putting in the value and i'm putting the expiry so when this cookie should expire so this cookie should expire in next 10 minutes so if in next 10 minute if you are going to buy if you click on the buy item without making any call again you need to ask do the login okay you are getting this flip card stuff and then ultimately i am using another function called http.setcookie and this is how you will write a cookie into your response and once you have written a cookie into your response on your client side this is how you will get it so from response you can say so this is the you will do client dot uh, request you got the response now in response you will go to all the cookies and you know that there will be only one cookie so i just want to get the first cookie which is on the zero th position and i got that cookie and i'm just printing that cookie and you see this cookie it is having session id this is the same as session id what we have it here correct okay and then there is a expiry which is next 10 minute so now what we need to do whenever we are calling this by handler we need to pass this cookie okay so let me just do that right away by copy pasting this by handler okay and let me just do that okay so now when i'm uh, doing this by i'm making this by request i'm passing this cookie add cookie so whatever the cookie i got in my login session i'm passing so this is another things you see on the request object we are setting add cookie here we set on the request object set basic authentication here we set the add cookie sort of things and once we set those things it will available in my by handler okay in by handler we are not uh, reading the cookie but let me just copy paste the code in by handler okay and let me just put this here okay let me restart my server and let me just uh, do these things and now you see that uh, how it is happening on the login it is actually calling this login handler it is returning a cookie it is like the set call to the cookie and this is the cookie now it is a, another random number this cookie we have got it here and we are setting this cookie on the buy buy item call when you are making a buy item call in buy handler if you say get cookie what is what we are doing here so uh, we are doing get cookie and we will get this cookie here so now i know when i created this particular session session value i i should have kept it into my some case like redis case or somewhere and when i got this uh, by handler i will check that whether this session is actually exist and whether it says this session is valid it is like not expire for 10 minute and whatever and if it is so then i will actually uh, add so this i know that this particular session i have given to a user called nur ali okay so i will add into the nurali shopping cart so he will be having one cart i will add this item to his shopping cart fine now nurali wants to buy another another item okay so he will make another call of buy so here in client we will be making another call okay so now i want to buy another item so previously i bought this one uh, and quantity is 2 now i am making this is equal to 2 uh, i002 and quantity is 1 okay so let me rerun this guy let me rerun this also okay now what is happening i have created this session i am saying buy item once buy item two and you see that this login handler has created this new session and you see that this buy handler in this session they have actually got this item and in this session the same session they have asked for the another item so now they know that both this item is actually bought by this particular session this is which is associated with nothing but nurali okay and this is how you will actually manage your session in http way uh in real life like nowadays people in the microservice world fine in the microservice world like we don't have session handling in this way because like each api call which we are making we will pass our authentication details like jwt token but if you have a monolithic web application you can use this particular way of managing a session but even you are not managing a session you can you can use this functionality of cookie you can set this cookie fine so say for example your 
uh, your web application there is a white mode and there is a dark mode like there is a light mode and there is a dark mode fine everywhere now you see those things so such sort of preference you can set into your cookie that what user has selected like dark mode or light mode and uh, yeah this is like set cookie and this is like this is how you will from the request you will actually read the cookie by passing the name of the cookie okay and you will get all these things so you can uh, i i am going to share all this code and what we have learned in this demo for it is mainly about session management using cookie okay by handler and login handler on server side we have understand how to get this request.header.get so you see here in the login we have done this request.header.get to get the authorization header which is nothing but this basic this particular terms right what else we understood request with the cookie and cookie name so you see that uh, in this request cookie and passing the cookie name and you will get actual cookie and the cookie struct and you will say that this is the cookie struct which we understand on the server side what we have understand on the client side we have have a request with the set basic authentication so when you do a login call you will do set basic authentication then there is this add cookie which you do when you are making another call with your for a buy and in response you are getting this cookie so this is in the response you are getting this cookies so this is my demo for and i think this is my last demo any more question uh can you share this cookie code for us your i will uh, yeah very well, well thank you very much yeah so i am going to put all this code uh, so yeah just let me summarize so this is what all we have covered fine everything you see on the client side these things on server side these things if you count this on your uh, finger it will come around uh, more than 30 stuff fine right? and uh, if you go to the website where http package is actually you will find everything now see this is your http package fine okay there are constants you you understand this constant now fine right? method get method post and there are more fine right? but yeah you understand this constant then uh, let me just see what are this this is there are function fine right? so what are the function you know this error function fine right? we have written it uh, to say that okay missing category fine right? this handle we have register our handler handler from this is another way of registering this is listen and so this is very first we did it fine uh, similarly you will find a lot many other things okay set cookie yeah you will set this http dot set cookies okay status text these are the function we have covered like so many function we have covered types there are so many types so we have covered this client type fine on the client side http client so they have this client dot do client dot get this is what what we have worked with fine then this is cookie is there fine so cookie we have created cookie on the server side right created a new fresh cookie session id then and then and then this is handler yeah so this handler is also like cover sort of things if you just uh, get those things this handler function is also covered then this header yeah you are adding a header fine like you are adding a, you, you are just calling this uh, set basic for but ultimately it is adding a adding a header okay then this is request we have come through fine so in request we know that we have done this uh, set basic auth right then we have done this add cookie fine but we have uh, this new request fine we have done this new request fine so we have done few of them we have done this cookie right get the cookie but yeah now you got the how you what this request object is for fine that is more more important to understand now response you know response we have understand this things fine we have got this cookies like we got all the cookies on the client side okay and there are some other stuff and uh, we have actually understand this server marks fine registering the server handler in a different way we also understand this server right on the server side we created this and we were calling this uh, listen and serve directly right we were setting the handler and all and transport which on the client side we did it fine so yeah uh yeah so we have got a couple of stuff in the, i think like if you understand this much stuff like uh, if you are just writing a web application and if you are calling a third party api i don't think so you will go out of this yeah i mean maybe possible that like uh, we have just used this http method get and method post and you will be writing method put and all but now you have the idea of those things and then this cookie like cookie is for session handling but yeah you can also use it for setting the preference of the user thank you my linkedin handler is nurali my name is nurali virani but my linkedin handler is something called nurali hyphen techy and all my 
meetup code you can just open this link i will be sharing these slides so i have given uh, uh, more than 10 uh, talk on the this particular group and all my previous talk is here and i will uh, so today or tomorrow depending on i get time i will add one more entry number 14 where i will put go http and i will share all the code i will share the slides and whatever you have seen so far it will be there for you to use it uh, thank you very much and yeah i'm open for question if there are any okay nothing on chat <laughs>